It's a major media deal worth half a billion dollars. New ownership for the San Diego Union Tribune and the LA Times after years of cutbacks and upheaval. Water bills are skyrocketing across San Diego. Why the city says its new smart meters are not to blame. And the backers of SDSU's expansion into Mission Valley say it won't cost taxpayers a penny, but could it still tap into public dollars? I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me today on the KPBS Roundtable are Laura Wingard, Managing Editor of iNewsSource, Tony Perry, former LA Times Bureau Chief in San Diego, Claire Tregesser, Multimedia Reporter for KPBS News, and Eric Anderson, Business and Environment Reporter for KPBS. Well, for decades, San Diego's largest newspaper operation was owned by the same family, the conservative Copleys. Now the San Diego Union Tribune is about to have its fifth owner in a decade. The big part of this newspaper sale is the purchase of the UT's parent paper, the Los Angeles Times. But San Diegans have to wonder how the hometown paper might change under the latest new owner. So Laura, who bought, start, start with the, who, who this buyer is and give us a little thumbnail. It's a surgeon who made a big fortune in cancer right. uh, drugs, right? Uh, Dr. Patrick Soon Chung uh, has has bought the LA Times and the UT for five hundred million dollars. Um, he entered sort of the news market in 2016 when Gannett was trying to buy all of Tronc, which is the last owner of the the UT. Uh, he came in, invested like seventy million dollars to fend off those owners, um, and uh, there was a brief there was brief conversation I think last year that uh, he might be interested in this purchase, but Tronk wasn't interested in selling off any part of the LA Times. That's all changed. Um, but uh, the doctor is an interesting character. I mean, he's known in San Diego because he's, you know, part of our, you know, from the biotech aspect, this is a biotech hub, and so he's known. He's, you know, he wants to cure cancer. Um, he's got cancer drugs. He's done a lot of things like that. Um, he's, he's an interesting man. Uh, uh, born to Chinese immigrant parents, and uh, you know, I think there's a lot of hope for what he might bring to this uh, this new uh, media world. Also, uh, part owner of the LA Lakers, and had some bitter battles. You referenced with the executives at, at Trunk, and so he said, "The heck with it, I'll buy the place." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I can tell you, I you know, I've worked for four of the five owners <laughs> at the UT, um, and. Uh, there was when there was this brief period when the uh, when uh, the doctor was contemplating and asking if he could buy it. I remember Jeff Light, the editor, uh, being asked by staff, "What do you know these people?" And I don't think Jeff actually had ever met Patrick uh, in terms of through Trunk. I think he had met him somewhere else. But he described him as a very precise person, very thoughtful very different than Mike Farrow, who owns the a trunk and is very uh, flamboyant, I guess would be a word I'd use. So, so Tony, morale in the Times newsroom, uh, fairly dismal. They they just unionized back with a newspaper guild here. Uh, you would think anybody would be better than what they had. Huh? Indeed, this is the end of an 18-year um, saga, tragedy of mismanagement. The Chandler family that built the Los Angeles Times into one of the best papers in the country sold in 2000. Along came the uh, Tribune Corp, the uh, predecessor of Tronk, and it was bad from the beginning. It was a mismatch. It was, as uh, one book writer said, it was uh, a deal made in hell. And they, uh, the Tribune people demanded, demanded, demanded cuts, cuts, 20% profit, not good enough. Let's get it up even more. Resistment, uh, resistance in uh, Los Angeles at the Times, four editors uh, in succession either uh, fired, uh, quit, retired. Uh, and that was just the beginning. And uh, what began in tragedy, I think, sort of ended in farce. This last couple of folks sent out from Chicago, it was pretty dreadful. And there was a revolution, there was a revolt. In the newsroom, they unionized, first time in the newspaper's history. And so when the word spread the other day that the doctor is in the house, uh, <laughs> there was cheering. There was jumping up and down, I would imagine as reporters are wont after deadline, they went out to certain uh, places <laughs> and libations were, uh, were in evidence. And it can't possibly be worse than what the Tribune Corporation Tronc did to this newspaper. 
2000, the year of the sale, 1,100 news employees at the Los Angeles Times. Today, about 400. What does that tell you? I could spin all sorts of tales. LA Times won four Pulitzers in 2005. In 2004, not a peep out of the Tribune people. In fact, within weeks, they were demanding, hey, let's cut even more. And the UT, of course, has seen similar uh, contractions. So have newspapers Absolutely. across the country in that time. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I can't even count how many layoffs I endured under Copley, Manchester, uh, Platinum, and then, uh, you know, uh, Doug Manchester, and then Tronk. And I think that was that is one of the things, I don't know that, that you won't have more layoffs. I think it's it's a tough business that they're in, but I think the what you talk about, the Tribune ownership at the UT, having to, to deal with shareholders, that was really tough. I mean, it was like, you're making a profit. The UT is making a profit, but it's like, here's this entire chain, it's not enough, Shareholders, board members, they want more, they want more. And, you know, there's not, they're trying innovative ways at both organizations. It is amazing to me the amount of incredible journalism that is going on at both institutions despite. The, what I would call really a lot of upheaval. Well, in, in it seems like the new owners more focused on the LA Times. Does anyone have a sense of what is planned for the Union Tribune? People don't know yet. Uh, there's sort of a, a wait and see. He's, he's 65 years old. He's worth $8 billion, um, lives in Los Angeles. So you're right, the focus. And he tried to buy the LA Times, as did a number of uh, big money folks in LA when they saw the tragedy of the Tribune Corp ownership. They tried and were rebuffed and rebuffed. Only recently, when it became obvious that uh, Tronk and Michael Farrow just simply didn't have it on how to run a big newspaper, uh, Joe Nacera, a big time uh, business columnist for Bloomberg, formerly New York Times, he wrote a column very tough uh, two weeks ago, said it's time for them to sell. They cannot run the LA Times. They don't have the, I'll read here, resources, leadership, persistence, or imagination to run the Los Angeles Times out as it ought to be. I don't know if he knew a sale was uh, imminent, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know of anyone that would disagree with his analysis. Have, Eric? Haven't we seen the, the, the white horse come riding into town before? Be careful on with that. The, with the optimism it, that the new owner will make the changes that need to be made to make it viable. Exactly, and you've used the appropriate word, owner. This man, the doctor, mm -hmm. the doctor's in the house, he's an owner. Let's not figure he's going to be a sugar daddy. Look at his business history. He buys, he sells, he's a hands-on kind of guy. He has not given any indication what he wants for the Los Angeles Times, how to make money in a very difficult industry. As, and I don't know that he's given any thought to the San Diego Union Tribune. Now the question will be, who does he bring in? It's not just him. Will he bring in good people, good managers, publishers, good editors in Los Angeles? That will be, that's been the problem with Tronk and the and Tribune. They would bring in we, sort of family retainers who just didn't have it. How long do you think it'll be before we know, before we start to find that out? Will it be a long process? Will we, we know? We've got a bit quickly? of time here because this is not going to be publicly held, right? When you're publicly held, it's quarter to quarter to quarter to quarter. When you're privately held, and that's not a formula because Doug Manchester, uh, Sam Zell, and others have been known to run a car into the ditch. Um, You've got a bit of time if he decides to take time. Again, he's 65 years old, so I don't know that he's thinking 25 years out, but I think he's got some time. He's got to staff up. He's got to hire some managers. You don't just uh, turn the key and it's the engine roars to life. Laura? One of, one of the things that's different at the, at the Union Tribune is during all of these ownership changes, Jeff Light has been the editor right. since 2010. He's also now the publisher. That happened under Tronk. Their managing editor is Laura Sakalo, who's been there for several decades. And, uh, you know, so, and we, she's jokingly referred to as Elmer. She is the glue of the <laughs> newsroom. And she, uh, she holds a lot of things together, and, and she and Jeff are a very good team. So I think, you know, they're hopeful. I think Tronk sold. I mean, it, it wasn't in their interest to, to keep the UT because it gets printed out of the LA Times. There's been a lot of There's synergies be between yeah. those two. Well, and there could and, be more in the future, but I think, I, I really have to emphasize that I think the worst thing that could happen is to make the Union Tribune like a bureau of the LA Times. It has never been a bureau. The LA Times doesn't dictate things. The two papers share story budgets. They share stories. When I was there, I would get a request, hey, we want your 
uh, Trump University story. Let us know when you posted it. So. All right. Well, we're going to check with our friends and see what happens with the paper and watch it as the months go by, and it's going to be very interesting, a new ride. We're going to move on. How does a water bill quadruple, or in one case, go from $150 to $3,300 in the space of a single month? Many San Diegans are protesting shocking spikes in their water bills, especially after hiring plumbers who could find no leaks. Uh, Claire, start with these uh, spikes and what the homeowners have been complaining about with these shocking bills. Right, so there have been reports um, from across the city. Uh, I talked with one homeowner in Normal Heights who said that he got a corrected water bill in December that said, we've gone back through your water usage through last March, and it turns out you actually used 1,000 gallons of water a day, normally uses 100 gallons of water a day on average, and so you owe us 3,000 some odd dollars. Um, and, and there are reports like that from across the city and lots of different media outlets. Well, this uh, story has had people riled up yeah. and Mayor Faulkner said any overcharge is unacceptable. Councilwoman Barbara Bree pushed for a full scale probe. We got a bite here from her. Let's hear what she said. And when government does something wrong, it has to be willing to stand up and say, we did something wrong and we're going to fix it. In this case, we don't yet know if something wrong has happened in a computer system or with lots of meters, um, but we need to get to the bottom of this. All right, so Claire, finally yesterday the city announced it's got a, a culprit. So according <laughs> to the city, what do they say caused these bills to shoot the moon? So they are blaming it on one errant water meter reader who made several mistakes. <laughs> um, and so, and they're saying it's only happened in, in certain areas, the Mira Mesa area, Ranchos Penasquitos, um, places like that. Carmel Valley, Rancho Bernardo. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and so they're kind of making it sound like, okay, problem solved. We found this person. They say he, he or she is no longer with the city. They won't, you know, specify any more than that. But it doesn't really explain because there are other, all these other reports from La Jolla say Barbara Bree said she had 100 people complain to her office. So that's not in those areas. The person I talked to in Normal Heights, he's not in that area. So it doesn't seem like the mystery is completely solved. What does this say Tony? about how the city of San Diego, God bless it, uh, responds to, to problems. Right, I mean, do they exactly. jump right on it and fix it? No. Or do <laughs> yeah. they let it get worse and worse? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounded like from people who were trying to contact the water department or public utilities department, they were saying, you know, they were getting nowhere. The utilities department was trying to say, oh, it's because we had this water rate increase and the billing cycle is a little bit longer. So that's why your bill looks higher. That doesn't explain, you know, $3,000 water bills. And they're just waiting and waiting until finally, you know, council members are getting involved saying you have to get to the bottom of this. And then they say, okay, we'll take a look. Oh, oops, no customer here we advocate are. that I can call and, and bend their ear and it's, they go fight for me? Well, it's funny. Barbara Bree said that. You know, they were thinking about, oh, can we call an environmental consultant? Can we call UCAN? Oh, actually, we thought about the city auditor. Let's just ask him. And he said, sure, no problem. We'll look into it. But isn't the Laura? risk in this, too, is like if you get a $1,300 bill, right. you can't pay it. You don't have $1,300. You can get your water shut off, right? And isn't that one of the concerns that people initially had and yeah, now? Yeah, that, that was one of the initial concerns. Now the utilities department is saying, okay, you can pay an average amount based on what you paid last year while we look into this, so we won't turn off your water. You just pay us a little bit, and then once it's all resolved, we'll figure out how much you actually owe. And doesn't mm -hmm. the city have some sort of a system in place that is designed to deal with these questions when they get them? Well, now they do, apparently. I mean, you would think that they would have, they said they're gonna increase their alert system so that when someone's bill all of a sudden quadruples or something like that, it would trigger something that then they could go and look into it. But it didn't, they said that that's one of the steps that they're taking now, so I'm not sure that they did have something like that in place. They're also talking about that supervisors will be signing daily reports. They just had this long list of things that you look at it and say, weren't you doing that already? That seems like something you should have already been doing. Maybe. Well, people need to have confidence that their water usage is being measured properly and accurately, as the mayor says, and everybody agrees, and that they're getting uh, billed properly. Now, um, uh, Michael Vogel, Deputy Director of the Public Utilities Division, said earlier on KPBS Midday that all 250,000 water customers are going to have their, their meters read now, and they're not going to guess we'll have 
apparently a fresh start. But then we're going to shift into this whole smart meter thing. How is that going to work? And some customers, I guess about 18,000, already have the smart meter. Everybody will in a couple of years. Right. They're rolling it out. I think it'll be done by 2020. And then the idea, I think, is that you don't actually need someone to go out and look. They're digital water meters, so this you know possibility of human error is removed, I think, is the idea. But it's still you know a ways away, and a lot of the people who had misreads, you know, at first it seemed like maybe these digital meters were to blame, but no, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's actually human error. Mayor, I know he he sent out a press release. Did he grab onto this thing early and? walk out there and talk to reporters and take questions with microphones in his face? He sent a statement that was part of a press release See. from the utilities department saying, we will not stand so for this. So he's there, but he's not there. <laughs> and that was yesterday. Yes. Yeah. He didn't say anything before. No, yesterday. no, he hasn't said anything oh, before. Oh, boy. Now, among the, uh, the um, things you said that we're going to do with the spot, jerks, uh, uh, spot checks, it is, and the red flag, uh, about unusual spikes. They say they also have a campaign to let water users know how to read their own meters and track usage. This would be before everybody gets a smart meter. Percentage. Right. I guess one of the things is they're going to be sending out pamphlets to let people know, here's how you can check your own water meter. So if you get a bill that looks off, you can go in and have a look at it yourself and say, well, actually, you know, it's this amount. Um, All right, let me let me ask you, Eric, <laughs> Laura, <laughs> Tony, been here using water a long time, almost every day, right, Eric? Uh, you Absolutely. ever go out and check your meter? Or you I have no idea where the water meter would even be on my property. <laughs> so I know Tony? what the gas meter is. It's above ground, but I don't know where the water uh, meter is. I send my wife out periodically as part of her uh, <laughs> choice. <laughs> in exchange for me paying the rent. Um, <laughs> to the answer, no. Okay. I have, no, I'm, with, I'm over here. Laura, no you're a typical. Uh, person who... uh, I know where mine is, okay. and I send my husband out, and he's actually, <laughs> after today, he said, he goes, I'm going out and checking the water yeah. meter. <laughs> well, in the course of doing the story, I said, oh, I wonder where ours is, and we found it, but you need, like, a concrete pole or a uh, pole to go into this concrete to lift it out to be able to actually get at the water meter, so... Right. So not likely that the average person is really keeping track themselves. They've got to rely on yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and with the person that I spoke to, um, you know, he sent a demand letter to the city saying there's no way that I'm using 1,000 gallons of water a day. And he never heard back from them, but they went in and changed his bill back to the normal amount online. So he w logged back in and said, oh, OK, I guess I don't owe any money, but I have no so, idea what so happened. So if you have problems uh, with the city of San Diego, be a squeaky wheel. Right. Know. Yeah, he went down there. He's a Don't lawyer. Don't do he it without wrote out a letter. A, lot of you know, a lawyer. A lawyer, <laughs> yeah. that helps. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Lawyer. We'll keep an eye on this one going forward. It's got people uh, people's attention, that's for sure. Well, voters this November are being asked to back a plan for San Diego State University to develop the coveted stadium site in Mission Valley. SDSU West is the project's name, and a critical element is uh, to the sales pitch is that no taxpayer money will be involved. But that's not the entire story regarding use of public funds. So, Eric, start by outlining this uh, project, SDSU uh, what's the, uh, West, what's the key elements and the price tag? Well, sure. Uh, what uh, San Diego State University, the Friends of San Diego State University, a booster group, wants uh, is to advance an initiative, uh, put it on the ballot in November, that will give the university the opportunity to buy 133 acres of this 166-acre site in Mission Valley where Qualcomm Stadium and that big attractive parking lot now currently sits. Um, what they want to do once they buy the land is they want to build a multi-use sports stadium there. They want to put housing in, presumably for students, staff, uh, and market rate housing. They want to have some commercial areas, some office space uh, that they could use as, as, as teaching space, and to basically create an auxiliary campus uh, for the university. And they're suggesting through this initiative that you know, they'll set a price. Uh, uh, they'll not engage the public in a way that requires taxpayer dollars. Uh, they'll set a price for it. They'll buy the land from the city, and then they'll begin the process of developing it. Okay, so the price tag isn't there yet, and we're going to have to... It is not. It's something that will be set by the, the San Diego City Council, which is... Uh, you may also be aware that there's a competing FS investors, push Soccer that, right. City that wants to redevelop that land, do very much the same in terms of development, but leverage the development to lure a major league soccer team here. Um, uh, and they have a different idea on how they want to go about so doing that. We could Tony? have on our November ballot two dueling propositions, complex, 
lots of money, lots of moving parts, so that when lots we finish- Lots of demand on the voter. Absolutely, when we finish reading our own meters, uh, <laughs> we're gonna have to compare these Become land two use experts. and decide traffic, air pollution, money, aesthetics, right? Uh, the good thing is, is you'll be able to take those ballot measures with you to the beach and you can do all of your research <laughs> Some are reading all on the up. sand. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the idea that um, uh, the friends of SDSU put forward is that they wanted to have uh, the voters have an option. FS investors last year qualified their issue for the ballot the this Soccer November, City, yeah. Soccer City. Yeah, they delayed um, it. And, and Friends of SDSU said, well, we want our measure to be on that same ballot so voters have a choice. And their pitch is uh, in some ways similar and in some ways different. Won't right. sections of the proposals still have to come back to either the council or vote uh, with potential litigation by someone who doesn't like what they're doing? Uh, uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I watch a lot of them on TV. Um, you know, litigation is a funny thing, and and I, I think any time when you have such a big project that this is that is this complex with so many moving parts on both of these two options, um, that certainly is a possibility. Um, I think the push for San Diego State is uh, echoes a little bit of what FS Investors was offering. Uh, FS Investors said, "Look, we want to come in. We want to build this." entertainment, soccer-focused area development in Mission Valley. Um, we're gonna leverage it to lure a soccer team here, and we're gonna do it without using any taxpayer dollars. Well, and that brings me back to the kind of the theme of your story this week is SDSU says no taxpayer funds. SDSU here this, echoed that, they, right, they echoed in their that. proposal. So we have a bite, rather long bite here, uh, from your interview, the back and forth, and how they explain the difference between that and the public funds here. Let's, let's hear that. And you're okay with hearing uh, the president of the university say, we're not gonna use any public money on this project. Yes. And because you feel uncomfortable that the, that some people might look at that and say, but money from a city account, money from a state fund. I am not uncomfortable with it. And you don't think it's inaccurate? I don't think it's inaccurate. And you feel okay going to the voter and saying, look, we're not gonna use taxpayer dollars. That's correct even though you may use taxpayer dollars? Even though there may be f taxpayer dollars coming from a state bond initiative, yes. We're not going to raise your taxes. Those bond money's already there. Explain first, who are you talking to? What, what Steve Doyle, Steve Doyle is a member of the steering committee of Friends of SDSU. What he's talking about is, is um, leveraging some of the already existing city funds uh, that have been set aside to build a river park in the Mission Valley area. Developers have been paying fees for their projects. It's been put into an account with the intent that it would be used for uh, the construction of a river park. He's saying, if we're going to build a river park down there, why can't we access that money? Uh, what I asked him back was, if you access that money, that's taxpayer money that the city's holding on to. It's public money. Can you still justify saying that you're not going to be using public money if you want to tap into this account. He also talked about leveraging state bond money uh, that's been set aside for parks. Uh, he said, if we can get state bond money for this project, why wouldn't we do that? Um, and he argues that it's not raising taxes, so he doesn't feel uncomfortable there. Uh, but uh, what I asked was, isn't that still taxpayer dollars? Public money. And We're gonna hear about this Tony. come November, right? I would imagine the... Uh, the opponents of this plan and also the competitors, they're going to remind us of just so what you reported. So investors isn't isn't using isn't tapping into any of those um, pools of money. Uh, the FS investor plan is structured a bit differently, and and without getting lost too much in the weeds, I think the big thing to remember is is that the the majority of the San Diego State University uh, Friends of SDSU plan involves buying 133 acres. The FS Investor Plan involves buying just a shade under 80 acres and leasing the other 80 acres. So will they site. make a point that San Diego State University, God bless it, is actually gonna have public money in their project? Are we gonna hear about that? Uh, From the opponents. I can't 
say for sure, but it would seem like that I would be a television a commercial <laughs> coming talking in point at some Sarah, point. Laura? One of the things I wonder about is, has the city done an appraisal of its valuable 166 acres? And we do, do we know what they would charge each of these entities for that? And yes, they have. But this is kind of an interesting thing, too, in the two initiatives. The city uh, did a, an appraisal of the land, and they valued the land at $110 million. This is the 100. 66 acres plus the Murphy Canyon site. And they said, you know, less the land that they were gonna sell, the value is about $85 million, and that's what the FS investors mm -hmm. are willing to pay. Um, the Friends of SDSU want the city council to do an appraisal, either through an outside appraisal, but they want uh, well, an appraisal to come from- Well, we're gonna talk about this, and it's <laughs> very complicated, and many more times where we are out of time notes. today. Yeah, <laughs> keep following it. That does wrap up another week of stories on the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Laura Wingard of iNewsource, Tony Perry, former LA Times reporter, Claire Tregesser of KPBS News, and Eric Anderson, also of KPBS. And a reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.